All right. Well, John, couldn't help but notice you published this book here, a collection of essays, Pulp Head. And I wanted to start with a really uh, simple question. Uh, are, are you the next David Foster Wallace or not? What's going on with this? No, I mean, I'm, I'm, that's, that's, I'm embarrassed by that. OK. You know. It wasn't my idea. I mean. No. no. OK. I don't, I don't really consider David Foster Wallace within like the range of my. You're so far beyond him. No, the opposite. <laughs> oh. I, you know, I just don't. Technically, I don't. I, I just think that he's way, way, way past me. So I don't. That's not. You know, that would just be debilitating for me to think of him as as the model. You know, I. I you think those are big shoes to fill or something? Yeah. Yeah. They're well, large. let me tell you why I think people are saying that. Mm. One, people are desperate for a new literary hero. <laughs> you have a new book out. You might be the next David Foster Bingo. Wallace. <laughs> you know, wait till Liz Gilbert's next. You know book what? Comes You're out right. And I'm it'll him. Be about her. Uh -huh. yeah. But you do. I and now David Foster Wallace. For those of you who don't know, you can never be too certain. At a Manhattan literary event, uh, was a famous, uh, unfortunately deceased, uh, essayist and novelist and short story writer. Like John's work, uh, Wallace's work uh, is extremely intelligent and witty and conversational, approachable. Uh, yet intimidating because of the intelligence, and yet you still move forward through the thickets, and then you're rewarded with insights about things that oftentimes you might not have thought seriously about. Okay, for David Foster Wallace, it was cruise ships and language and tennis, the three stupidest things uh, our human civilization has ever produced, especially language. Uh, but your book uh, also takes, uh, some of the essays take as their subject things that I have not if I haven't thought, if, if I have thought deeply about them, it hasn't been in about 15 years. And of course, right now, I'm thinking about Axl Rose. Um, but, but one of the provocative points in your essay about Axl Rose uh, is your, your theory that without Guns N' Roses, Nirvana would not have been possible. Is that true? You're willing to back that up? It would be hard to do scientifically, but I do think it's true that they, at least the thing that people always give to Nirvana as sort of their um, discovery, you know, like the category they occupied of a, of a, of a hard rock band that got to stay hard cool. rock, but yeah, exactly, right. get mega famous. Yeah. Guns N' Roses had already occupied that, yeah. but they just didn't quite know how to do it, you know. Um, they didn't have the same style and the ability to code switch that Kurt Cobain did. You know, Hello. Axel has never code been able switch to code time. switch. He's just pure West Lafayette, Indiana, all the time, no matter where he goes. So you admit Guns N' Roses? So, so you admit Guns N' Roses is not a rock band; they are a pop band. I knew he was definitely a you. pop band. Definitely a pop band. I mean, think the, the, the songs you know, you know because they had fetching pop melodies. Their whole their whole legend is like this, you know, troublemaking rock band, right? I mean, that was that's not what got them on Casey Kasem. It was, you know, the melodies. She's got eyes. You know that was. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why did you? Why That's did what you we're stop? Still, why, why we're did, still listening? Many of their songs begin in the major, and then they switch to the minor, and that's when you're like, "Oh God, the scary voice is coming," and you start getting really excited. You, you call it the Devil Woman voice, yes, right? Devil Woman's coming. Devil Woman is coming. You know, always know in a Guns N' Roses song when Axel's getting ready, you know, to molt. Yeah. <laughs> to might take Woman. 15 years, but he'll he'll be ready.